Hello again, and for the final lesson of Bio 220 Microbiology. Welcome everyone to this lesson on Chapter 9, Biotechnology and DNA Technology. Just to introduce biotechnology, uh, that is a field that uses microorganisms, cells, or cell components to make a particular product, such as for foods, antibiotics, even vitamins and enzymes as well. We call it DNA technology, which involves the insertion and modification of genes to produce desired proteins. Recombinant DNA procedures always involve a vector, which is a self-replicating sequence of DNA used to transport a foreign gene or sequence of DNA into a different cell, as well as a clone, which is a population of genetically identical cells arising from one cell which carried that vector. Understanding one. All right, tools in the biotechnology. Well, there is selection, which is used for selecting for a naturally occurring microbe that produces a desired product. There is using biotechnology to produce a mutation, which mutagens cause mutations that might result in a microbe with a desirable trait, and also site-directed mutagenesis, which involves a targeted and specific change in a gene. For restriction enzymes, they can be used to cut specific sequences in a DNA sequence, and they will typically destroy bacteriophage DNA in bacterial cells. Methylated cytosines in bacteria will protect their own DNA from digestion. And well, in this situation, restriction enzymes may create blunt ends where a double DNA strand is cut straight or staggered cuts known as sticky ends where a small single strand sequence is left hanging off. There are a variety of restriction enzymes, and they all are very specific in what type of cut they'll perform, whether a blunt end straight down the middle, or, a, or will they leave sticky ends, and what sequences of nucleotide base pairs do they actually cut. Typically, a sticky end restriction enzyme, if it can be used, is preferred because sticky ends are much easier at rejoining later on, where blunt ends can be harder to actually stick together since they don't have the added effect of hydrobonding linking complementary strands. And this is just showing how restriction sites or the site where a restriction enzyme will cut happen in a initial strand of DNA or double strand of DNA. And if you use a restriction enzyme on two ends, you can get a you can cut out a specific gene or sequence of genes that can eventually be inserted into a plasmid vector. Now these vectors, these are what carry new DNA to desired cells and they must be able to self-replicate. Plasmids and viruses can be used as vectors to bring this new gene or sequence of DNA to a new host. There are vectors called shuttle vectors that exist in several different species and can move clone sequences among various organisms. Now the use of a plasmid for cloning. Essentially, you can incorporate a plasmid that has specific genes in them that are desirable to add to a new cell, and they might have very specific restriction sites 
such as in this case for HEN3, BAM, HI, and ECORI. That can be used to cut open the plasmid and insert it into the host cell's genome later on if desired. Now, PCR or polymerase chain reaction is an excellent technology for cheaply and inexpensively increasing small amounts of DNA into much more reasonable concentrations. They're used for diagnostic tests of genetic diseases as well as detecting pathogens. And it involves an enzyme called reverse transcript transcriptase in which reverse transcription PCR uses mRNA as a template to then build desired DNA strands. Essentially after each round of a PCR is run, the amount of desired DNA gets doubled and eventually through the doubling process to raised to some exponent, you can significantly amplify the amount of that desired sequence over time. Now for Inserting foreign DNA into cells, DNA can be inserted into a cell by a variety of ways. One is transformation, where cells take up the DNA from the surrounding environment. Or there could be electroporation, where an electric current is used to actually form holes in a cell's membrane, at which point that DNA can then leak into the cell. And there's also protoplast fusion, which involves removing cell walls from two bacteria and at which case it allows their plasma membranes to actually fuse and thus combining their contents. Such as a case of this diagram showing protoplast fusion where the cell wall is removed. And after the fusion of those two cells, the cell wall will form around the entire new hybrid. For another situation of inserting foreign DNA in the cells, there is actually things called DNA or gene guns and also microinjections. A gene gun is essentially something that, as the name implies, shoots bullets of DNA, bullets coated with desired strands and sequences of DNA into a collection of cells poking through their plasma membrane and inject and releasing the desired sequence. And micro injection is simply just taking a syringe containing the desired sequence and individually going into a cell and injecting that sequence, such as into an egg cell. Genomic libraries are collections of clones containing different DNA fragments. An, an organism's DNA is digested and spliced or joined into a plasmid or put into a phage vector, which can then be introduced into bacterial cells. At least one clone exists for every gene in the organism. Now, furthering genomic libraries, there are complementary DNA or cDNA, which is made from messenger ribonucleic acid by reverse transcriptase, where that RNA sequence is used to build a complementary strand of DNA. This is used for obtaining eukaryotic genes because eukaryotic DNA has introns that do not code for proteins mRNA has the introns removed or the sequences of genetic material removed, therefore only coding for the protein product that is desired.
There's also synthetic DNA, which builds genes using a DNA synthesis machine. Essentially, nowadays, we have many technologies which are very excellent at either amplifying small amounts of DNA to large amounts or making the desired sequence of DNA that one wishes to probe and use in research. Now, selecting a clone. Blue-white screening. This uses a plasmid vector containing ampicillin-resistant gene and beta-galactosocytase gene. The bacteria is grown in media containing ampicillin and exgal, a substrate for a beta-galactosidase. What's happening is that essentially having a gene, having a bacteria that has both a gene for the desired enzyme or product and a gene against protecting against a particular antibiotic helps get rid of the cells in a petri dish that did not pick up that plasmid and therefore does not have that antibiotic gene. Therefore, in the end, you're left with only the cells with the desired new gene. Now, in colony hybridization, this uses DNA probes, or short segments of single-stranded DNA that is complementary to the desired gene. When making a gene product, such in the case of E. coli, there are advantages in, se in the sense that they're easily grown and its genomics are very well understood. But disadvantages are that bacteria will typically produce endotoxins and does not secrete its protein products readily without getting rid of the cell. Now, there are Saccharomyces cerevisiae. They're easily grown and has a larger genome than bacteria. They express eukaryotic genes very easily. Now, there are plant cells and whole plants that express eukaryotic genes easily. Plants are easily grown on large scale and relatively low cost. And in the case of mammalian cells, they will express eukaryotic genes very readily and can make products for medical use, but they are harder to grow. Now, therapeutic applications can include human enzymes and other proteins, such as insulin, creating subunit vaccines, which are made from pathogen proteins in genetically modified yeast, non-pathogenic viruses, which carry genes or a pathogen's antigens, such as in DNA vaccines, you, the concept of gene therapy to replace defective or missing genes with healthy and functional genes, gene editing using the tool CRISPR to correct genetic mutations at very specific locations in a genetic sequence. And essentially, these are many examples of pharmaceutical products involving recombinant DNA. Further therapeutic applications, there is gene silencing, which involves making small interfering RNAs, or siRNAs, that will bind to messenger RNA, which is then destroyed by RNA-induced silencing complex. And there's RNA interference, RNAi, which inserts DNA encoding a small interfering RNA sequence into a plasmid 
which can then be transferred into a cell. The purpose of which is to help get rid of destructive or harmful messenger RNA sequences, preventing them from encoding proteins or genes that are not desired. Now the genome product projects. There's the shotgun sequencing, which involves sequences of small pieces of genomes, which are assembled by a computer. There's also metagenomics, which is the study of genetic material directly from environmental samples. The human genome project was used to sequence the entire human genome. And then there's the human proteome project, which hopes to map proteins expressed in human cells. Essentially, which proteins are typically produced in which type of cells and which genes eventually on DNA eventually lead to the, the formation of those proteins. Scientific applications, such as the study of bioinformatics, which is understanding gene function via computer-assisted analysis. These typically involve large collection of data. It's a form of data mining, where effectively you can scour large uh, libraries of genes and sequences of genetic material or biological information to try to test or probe for certain connections. That's effectively what the study of bioinformatics is, using computers and libraries of information to find biologically relevant connections. There's also proteomics, which is similar but used for determining proteins expressed in the cell, and reverse genetics, which is discovering a gene's function from a particular genetic sequence. A tool that is used in this scenario is southern blotting, where DNA probes are used to detect specific DNA fragments that are separated through gel electrophoresis. And then there is genetic testing, which is screening of parental or fetal tissue for several hundred possible genetic diseases, essentially seeing what parents might potentially pass on to their children or potentially what a developing fetus currently has, if anything. There is forensic microbiology, which can involve DNA fingerprinting, which is used to identify types of pathogens present, polymerase chain reaction or PCR microarrays, and DNA chips can screen samples from multiple pathogens. They also, there are, this differs from medicine because it requires two things, proper collection of evidence and establishing a chain of custody. Nanotechnology is also involved in biotechnology. Essentially, bacteria can make molecular-sized particles with ease, and nanospheres used in drug targeting and delivery to take in a proper concentration of medicine to very specific regions, such as perhaps parts of the brain passing the blood-brain barrier, or to certain organs as well. Then there is type plasmid, which occurs in Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It integrates into plant genome and causes a tumor-like growth. Can be used to introduce recombinant DNA into a plant-based organism. And these tumors can often be called crown galls or 
I should restate that. This is an example of crown gall disease on a rose plant. And genetic modification can be used to actually insert genes to protect plants from illnesses that might destroy crops or make plants healthier in the specific environment they're in, where maybe some plants grow in environments that are less harsh, but there might be ways to genetically modify them to help them grow in more struggling areas in parts of the world that need that resource. Now, agricultural applications include BT toxins, herbicide resistance, suppression of genes in the antisense DNA, nutrition, and human proteins. Essentially things to things that can possibly be added, whether suppressing undesirable genes or making a herbicide, helping plants to become resistant to a herbicide or creating desirable human proteins that might not currently be able to be made in non-functioning DNA sequences. Naturally, there are ethics to consider. There, needs, there is a need to avoid accidental release into the environment, which could have a whole host of problems affecting the local area. Genetically modified crops must be safe from consumption, for consumption, as well as be safe for in the environment that they are in. Indeed, who would have access to an individual's genetic information for people who are getting genetic therapy, who has the who who can you trust and who is safe to have your genetic sequence with? And as I'm cycling through the appendices of various figures discussed in this final presentation, just wanted to say congratulations on all of you for making it through, no joke, making it through this concluding lesson for online microbiology. It was certainly a lot of work, and I am very incredibly amazed at all of you for deciding to take such an intense course in such a condensed format. I truly hope that this course meets your requirements for your desired programs and that you can go on better prepared for future classes and also ideally that you will all finish your programs one day, whether they're in nursing, respiratory technology, or a variety of other things that you might be doing. No joke, you're all very just, this is just amazing that you all did this. Anyways, without further ado, it was a pleasure to have all of you for this class. And well, good luck in the remainder of your studies and may you all complete your lessons in other classes incredibly well. I wish you all a very excellent rest of your time. Peace out, every single one of us. Bye-bye.